you know, what about you has never led to any significant societal change uh, and never will, which is why most, you know, any, any phrase that starts with what about largely should be ignored. Michael McCann, thank you very much for joining us today. How are you? Do you know what? Normally that's such a like regulation question at the start of an interview, isn't it? But actually sort of in light of what we're talking about, I feel pretty numb, to be honest. Yeah, it's been a it's very strange uh, 72 hours in the world of f- football and the World Cup. So obviously this morning, the England team and other nations uh, d- decided not to wear the one love armband, despite seeming adamant beforehand that they would. Out of maybe fear of getting a yellow card or a player being removed from the pitch, they said it wasn't fair on the players. What was your reaction to that when you saw the news? My immediate reaction was huge disappointment at a missed opportunity to show that people like me and LGBTQ plus people across the world belong in sport as much as anybody else. It's weird. I've seen colleagues already talking about this. It's quite hard to how do you be not surprised at the same time whilst being disappointed to hear it nonetheless i mean that's the kind of cycle that lgbtq plus people have been in around men's football for a very very long time way before we get to this world cup and in a way everything around this world cup is a metaphor for that and so for me it was kind of a bit of a a groundhog day i kind of expected something like this would happen but at the same time you know, it, it gets to a point where it's almost difficult to be disappointed because you've set your expectations so low. And that's where I go back to just feeling quite numb, really. It, it makes me very uneasy the way there is and I've already already seen a lot of people trying to portray this narrative of oh it's just FIFA and FIFA are the really bad guys and we were trying to do all this really good stuff but we can't because they've stopped us to me that's very simplistic and not how I would perceive it and I know many other LGBTQ plus people feel the same way although as I said before on this it's a very individual topic it's a very divisive topic but what I come back to and I keep thinking of is let's say that they did wear it and they did get a yellow card you know you think of history and you think of how sport and politics interact in history when we look back on that image in 10 years time in 20 years time in 50 years time in 100 years time who are people going to be like oh Harry Kane was on the wrong side of history who are people they're going to be like no the referee but by extension really FIFA because that's the top down way that works we're on the wrong side of history in this case and it does also go back to and Adam Crafton's already written about this in the Athletic superbly today um, the, the sort of erasure of LGBTQ plus people from men's sport the invisibility and it's one conversation I always find myself having when working in men's football where people are like, oh, can't, can't someone just come out to help change things? And you try and explain the importance of allyship and you try and explain that actually it's the wider environment that is why that hasn't happened. And this is just a perfect example. Like if you've got players, but by extension the FA, who are not willing to do this very small, simple thing at the risk of getting a yellow card, then on a wider level, how is that an environment where someone would feel comfortable as a men's player to to come out? Like the two are just don't the two just don't fit at all. And by the way, this isn't about um, Harry Kane specifically. This isn't even about the FA specifically because obviously there's this collection of countries who it seems have all collectively climbed down from this. So this is beyond just an England thing. This is all of those countries and. The actions of FIFA shouldn't absolve them from a sense of scrutiny of, okay, well, that's what FIFA have said, but you are allowed to make up your own mind and do your own thing. And my goodness, let's just put it this way. Had they done it, that would have been an incredibly powerful thing. I mean, you only had to see Alex Scott do it. Um, I didn't watch the game. I didn't watch the build up, but uh, you couldn't ignore it because suddenly Alex Scott was trending everywhere on Twitter. Now, Alex Scott wore it whilst on broadcast 
rather than out on the pitch. I didn't have the threat of what FIFA did. But again, you could see how much that meant in terms of someone using their platform positively, using their platform to show that people like you, and of course, Alex Scott is part of that community, are represented. Yeah, absolutely. Um, are you, you mentioned you didn't watch the game. Have you decided to not watch any of it? Thought about that for a very long time. I, I just don't, it just all leaves me very numb and I don't really have that excitement to go and to go and watch all of it I just don't I mean I've got um, a commentate on both men's and women's football one thing I'm really happy about is that women's football um, regardless of the fact that if you uh, saw a lot of the mainstream media right now you would think it stopped existing for four weeks um, women's football is still very much around the WSL is still going the women's champions league is going and is better than ever this year and to me, I've got plenty of work in that that I want to be across and preparing for and doing to the best of my abilities. And for various reasons around human rights, around the LGBTQ plus community, around my own experiences, I'm just not particularly apathetic, I guess is the best word. I'm, I'm quite interested in issues like the Alex Scott situation, the armband situation around what is done visibly to highlight the need for things to change but in terms of the football itself I'm a kid that I grew up loving sport and I've had this kind of conversation with so many other people from uh, the LGBTQ plus community I've never felt this way about a world cup another really interesting point to make and Gareth Southgate actually said this is that ultimately if the LGBTQ plus community didn't exist like we're not even getting close to winning the women's Euros like a, like a huge percentage of that squad are out and openly LGBTQ plus. And I just, you know, part of me wonders with the Lionesses and then the men's team, you know, I'm not sure there's a, I know there's not really a huge amount of interaction because they're both doing their own things, but I, I'd be fascinated to see some of those men's players have a sit down with some of those women's players, you know, particularly people like uh, uh, lots of women who's very eloquent on societal and social issues, Leah Williamson, the captain, um, and talk through, some of these things because I wonder whether that you know we'll never know publicly but I'd be intrigued to know whether that's really ever happened that much because you know th this isn't some you know tiny portion of society that you know as men's football sometimes likes to kind of make out is sort of invisible and not that important it's like well actually particularly in the women's game like that's that's a huge part of why England are one of if not the favourites to win the World Cup next summer. But in the past you um, as a broadcaster you have worked in Qatar so um, what was that experience like for you? Because obviously there's a lot of um, people, I guess myself included, who comment on the issues without ever having gone there. So um, tell me a bit about your experience in Doha. Yeah, so I spent a year or so working there from 2018 to 2019. I knew at the time that I wasn't heterosexual, but I was not out. I went there with sort of curiousness and an open mind. I'd had mixed reports from people that I would trust um, and in the end chose to go. And then once I got there, I kind of, you know, I learned about things. Um, and to be honest, particularly through being able to be there, anyone, you know, would, would say that if you're talking about moving halfway across the world, you're able to educate yourself so much more about a place, particularly by actually being there. And what I quickly found from being there was... You know, I I don't tell anybody that I might not be heterosexual, um, but I really made an effort to get to know LGBT people and make it quite clear that I was a very safe person for them to know and kind of try and, you know, I was almost curiously fascinated, I guess, to, to try and get to know, like, is this, you know, how is this place compared to how it's perceived and the reality? Um, and particularly in terms of that community, the stuff and the stories and the the things that would happen will never leave me. You've just got people in constant fear and uh, not unjustified fear because things are happening very regularly that only add to that all the more. Um, and that's obviously not covering issues around migrant workers. You know, there's been a, a lot of discussion um, and in some some from some quarters sort of tentative praise 
for changes made. But even a couple of months back, you had a whole load of workers who went on strike over months of unpaid wages and they immediately get deported. And you just, there's no, there's nothing really to say beyond that because it just, I mean, things like that, never mind, you know, issues around deaths, et cetera, just speak for themselves, really. So, yeah, in terms of my experience, I was very aware that in a lot of senses, I was quite privileged in the sense that I was quite protected because you're working for, um, you're working for the government. There's also, um, you know, every society across the world has inequality. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But I've never been anywhere quite like Doha in terms of the way people were treated and perceived and and sort of categorized in terms of how things operated that was so obviously divided through like that. Um, and that was also something, you know, that, that just, again, it kind of stayed with you really. And I was very aware that in some sense, you know, in a lot of senses, I actually had a, you know, a, a lot of various kind of, in terms of almost the, racial system of how people often seem to get treated I was one of the luckier ones and also I wasn't a woman um, and I know there's plenty of people that have spoken out who have been out there very eloquently in the last week or so about their time experiencing that too so um, yeah it was it was a uh, yeah that was that was that really it's very bleak i'm trying to think of a more positive note to end on and can't find one well i do have one if you want one i do have one because i put it I, when i was putting together what i wanted to say about it i, I wanted to have something there um there's uh, a foundation called the r1 foundation which is well worth um people checking out and it is it's been established to campaign for lgbtq rights for people in the gulf region uh its founder is dr nas mohammed who is the first publicly gay Qatari. Um, might not surprise people to know that he's left Qatar and won't be returning um, because, I mean, I think that's a relatively sort of obvious one. Um, and basically, you know, that foundation, as well as the Proud Maroons, which he set up, which is, which is basically Qatar's LGBTQ plus supporters group. And obviously the irony is laid bare because it's a supporters group that you know the team wouldn't wouldn't want um they are they're well worth looking at and they're a place that i i've supported them personally in quite a few different ways um and i know that they're desperately trying to hope that the sort of prophecy that particularly lgbtq qataris that i've spoken to fear which is when this world cup ends potentially the you know the world's eyes move on that if anything they'll be a backlash in that sense and any legacy against them might even be to be honest a negative one um and i know the al one foundation is doing really good work to basically try and make sure that's not the case so you know if you want a scintilla of positivity i would say that going and looking at their work their foundation their website supporting the proud maroons is something um that can be done and on a wider level the other thing i finished um my statement by saying is we need to keep this level of energy and scrutiny for all major sporting events on a consistent basis. You know, what about tree has never led to any significant societal change uh, and never will, which is why most, you know, any, any phrase that starts with what about largely should be ignored. But it is important that the level of constructive critical scrutiny stays consistently on all of these major sporting events after this across various major sports because if that consistently happens then you would hope that you get to positions where change happens in terms of particularly men's football seeming more like a space that welcomes everybody and that of course would be uh, quite the opposite of a bad thing <laughs>